The Hanuti, that's really, uh, uh, people can read from light into darkness, that's basis there. Uh, we don't differentiate between a light priesthood and a dark priesthood. It was the priesthood. This is characterized, again, we're talking about this current age, the age of Amun, which began about 5,000 years ago. Interestingly enough, it coincides with the beginning of the Hebrew calendar and the beginning of the current Mayan calendar, which just ended December 21st, 2012, about 5,000 some odd years uh, it's characterized, as I said, by the rise of the patriarchal religions, by the rise of institutionalized warfare, and by dichotomy, the idea of labels, of, of separating people into red, black, white, brown, uh, of separating people into Jew, Christian, Muslim, of separating people into male, female, gay, straight. All of that began in this last 5,000 years. So the idea, who were the Hanuti? Well, Hakim gives a wonderful story, a, a lot of stories. As a great teacher, like, like the greatest teachers that have ever been, he always gave little simple stories that would explain great metaphysical truths. So he would say, now we're talking about, about uh, uh, after 12,000 years ago, after this great cataclysmic event, uh, what we know is that Northern Africa was not affected as much as maybe other parts of the world. Great tsunamis, 10 plus earthquakes, uh, uh, huge 300 foot tsunamis we're talking about. I mean, earthquakes, tornadoes, everything we can think of on a huge super scale. Uh, Egypt got it. There's no doubt that it affected. We, we talk about damage to the pyramids. We can show damage to the whole grid line we talk about. We can go into that more. But what we had then was the idea that after this cataclysmic event, it really shook the people out of their reverie. Those that survived, we believe survived with a collective trauma. The best person that if you ever want to interview or people want to follow up on this is Barbara Hand Clough. A book she wrote uh, in 2001 called Catastrophobia, dealing with this event. She has since updated it in 2011. It is called Awakening the Planetary Mind. I highly recommended. Barbara was a student of Hakim's before me. The first time I ever went to the Awiyan house, which is now my home in Egypt, Barbara Hanklau took me there in 1992. So she wow. talks about uh, a book that she published as the publisher of Baron Company called Cataclysm 9500 BC, written by two great British scientists, Alan and Delaire. They postulate that there was an event at this time, and we call it now, we, we identify it with what was known as the Vela supernova v-e-l-a it can be googled vela supernova occurred anywhere between fourteen thousand to eleven thousand years ago it was such a major event we believe it impacted our entire solar system not just our planet uranus interestingly enough a planet that's totally on its side on a 90 degree tilt that is not natural something knocked it on its side Right. We had a planet that existed between Mars and Jupiter. It is now known as the Kuiper Belt. That planet may have been destroyed during this event. And the Earth herself. The Earth today is at a 23.5 degree tilt. Uh, that is what gives us our equinox. Yeah. That gives us the wobble, our, our, our procession of the equinoxes. Well, Alan DeLapp postulated this event happened during the supernova. Before then, the Earth was upright. We had only two seasons, not four seasons. And so... We're saying that everything that happened after the uh, cataclysmic event affected humanity. We were still in that highest state of consciousness, but I believe there was a couple of thousand years, what we could call a, a temporal period, before it went into the current, into Amun, before Aten actually moved into Amun, the two last stages where we're in today, Amun, coming out of it today, there was thousands of years, and that thousands of years was a transitional period. During that period, people started to lose consciousness. So Hakim gives us this little story. There used to be an area where people would come to energize themselves. There were two stones. They probably were extraterrestrial stones, had uh, meteorites, or something that had a tremendous amount of energy. They were placed side by side over a stream of running water. Running water, we know, along with crystal in a stone, we can discuss this much greater because this is the technology. We're going to yeah. talk about the ancient commissions. We can do that in much more detail. But water running under crystal produces electromagnetic field. That electric Electric magnetic field we know is the source of what we call power points in the earth. Now, today, I have researched this for 50 years. I can say that what we call a vortex, a power place, a major energy, intersection of ley lines, all the different things that we call these things on our planet, there are three things that are always planted, present to create the energy. One, underground stream of running water. 
Two, a natural source of crystal. Three, igneous rock, which a volcanic stone like granitic granite is also high crystalline content. It is the running water and the crystal in the stone which creates the electromagnetic field, which gives us the energy spots of our planet. So these people, they, they, people knew that. There was, yeah. These stones were purposely placed there. The water was running. Everybody would go to energize themselves. Then we get the rise of this group of people we call Hanut. This is the original interpretation of who they were. These individuals, by virtue of different practices that they maintain, psychoactive plants, drugs, or breathing exercise, or whatever meditation, they were enabled to keep themselves in a higher state of consciousness while other people were starting to wane, starting to slip. They devised an idea. They said, let's put a line in front of the rocks. And the people have to line up behind it. Only we, the Hanut, can go now to the stones because only we have the connection to the divine. People have to depend on us. And as Hakim says, people would gladly give a piece of bread or a, a piece of silver or gold, whatever they had, to stand in line. This is the beginning of religion right mm -hmm. there. Religion is the ba it, I always define, and again, my second book is majorly discussing the difference between spirituality and religion. Academia, particularly sociology, uh, religious studies, psychology, they all, they all indicate that spirituality and religion are the same thing. Academia it teaches us we've always been hardwired for religion. We've always had some kind of religion. I say, we say, no. We've always had spirituality. As soon as a man, human being, develops some kind of con not just to look up and see stars, to see the, the, the base of life around them, there became an understanding of spirituality, that there was more than the body but spirit. But religion, no. Religion is now. Religion has to do with the business based on spirituality. So that's how it started. Everybody stand in line. And as he says, then, then we get the whole description of the evolution of the temple. So first it was a line. Everybody had to stand back in the line. Then they made that line a wall. Everybody had to stand behind the wall. Only the priests, the Hanuti, could go then to the Holy of Holies. Then they built a gate. Then they built pylons. Then they built the first what we call hypostyle hall with pylons. Then another gate. Then a men gate. Then the temple was born. That's how the temple evolved, to keep people out of the Holy of Holies. So that's how religion begins. So how we define Hanuti? Today, I would say to you, a Hanuti or Hanut is anyone who exploits another human being, or any living form for their own benefit. That's a lot of people today. Yeah. But the original definition of Hanut was funerary priest. Because what did they do then and after that? After getting people to stand in line and to build a temple, they then said to the people, have you ever wondered what happened to this, the physical body, the physical envelope, when you drop it? Because before then, there was no concept of death. One of the great teachings that Hakim presented, that in the ancient Kermitian language, there was no word for death. No word. It was said to be westing or going to the west. Yeah. They just saw it as changing form. The body wasn't important to them. Again, spirituality exists for over 50,000 years, more than that, hundreds of thousands of years. We've been spiritual beings for millions of years. Only religious beings, I say, for 5,000 years. Yeah. But they had that understanding. So then they would say, have you ever wondered what happens? Well, no, people hadn't really thought of it. They said, we'll tell you what. If you give us, they went to the food producing people who today we would call the farmers. And they said, you don't need all the food you produce, you don't need it. I mean, you could give it all to the, all the tribe. Right? There's still plenty left over. Why don't you give a quarter of your harvest to us, the Hanu, to the temple each year, and we will take care of this flesh envelope when you drop it. We'll do prayers for it. We will do magic. We will tell you that it's going to come back. We will, do, we will invent the idea of God. We will invent the idea of soul. We will invent the idea of resurrection and reincarnation. And you just give us this harvest and we'll take care of it. And they said, sure, why not? And religion was born. And it seems to be the birth of many other things as well <laughs> and, and into this uh, modern society. I, I, I can't help but hear the word uh, elitism going over in my head. Of course. Of course. Who would have first elites with a Hanut? Of course. They're already saying they're better than everybody else because they're keeping themselves aware. They're keeping themselves aware of the higher consciousness. Again, by doing these practices, it was the shamans, it was the first priests. Actually, it was women who first discovered psychoactive plants that became the drugs that we use today. And it was all to raise consciousness, to understand that you're more than the body. Anybody 
anybody that takes ayahuasca, anybody that took LSD in a pure spiritual sense, anybody that took uh, uh, a mescaline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, psilocybin, all was doing it to understand that we're more than the body. No.